served shoulder to shoulder, training together, exercising together. So you're sending a powerful message that NATO, including the United States, will defend Estonia, will defend Latvia, will defend Lithuania, will defend all of our NATO allies. As NATO allies, we stand together. We stand as one. So it is really important to work with other nations together uh, as close as you can and even before an operation starts. We represent U.S. commitment to the alliance. I mean, U.S. Army Europe, 30,000 soldiers, forward stationed in Europe. And then the Army's contribution is above that because of the rotational force capability that comes over and other exercises that will attract other units. What we've described the environment of the future is, it's going to be a very complex environment, it's going to be a multinational environment, changes very quickly. So when you take a look at the United States Army Europe, it's almost custom made to do that. I mean, it's right here in the middle of a very complex part of the world. Every day they work with multiple partners, they're working in multiple domains. We were in Cameroon, Africa in March. Uh, we were in Estonia when Operation Atlantic Resolve first kicked off. We were there for two months, and now we're here in Latvia, moving to Poland at the end of the month. So, a uh, great opportunity to get some unique experiences. That young troop commander is a senior U.S. Army officer who is planning an 1,836-kilometer road march back through four countries over a period of two weeks. I mean, what an incredible opportunity, is we're enabling this alliance. We're representing not just 173rd or 191. We're an actual representation of the U.S. Army. And the guys understand that, and we're here and ready to go. As part of the state partnership program, when the National Guard deploys forward to Eastern Europe, they bring capabilities that augment what we have in Europe, as well as continuing to develop relationships in our allies as they train together. We need the capacity and the capability that the Army brings, and the United States Army Europe needs it as well. The Army National Guard has been engaged in Europe for, for many years. And we're also finding ways to leverage our state partnership program across the eastern countries in Europe. Next year will be our 20th anniversary working with Croatia Armed Forces, both in the United States and Minnesota. So we want to continue that relationship as well as being able to provide forces in the future for Europe and continue to work with our state partner. The active duty troops do what they do, and they do it extremely well. What a lot of our foreign partners, especially in the state partnership program, treasure the most is seeing the same leaders and the same faces every time. There's a relationship that really carries through to a trust. The work being done by the Army National Guard, the Air Guard, and the Army Reserve is impressive, professional, and it's essential. The Guard and Reserve are essential to making our 30,000 look and feel like 300,000. To meet new security challenges, we're adapting using a new playbook, an approach that is both strong and balanced. NATO allies are only growing more united. The NCOs right in the back of the room. If uh, after watching that, anybody wants to take a burst of six, uh, we'll sign you up. So, General Grass, uh, General Hargett, all of you, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this uh, conference. Uh, I asked for it uh, months ago uh, as I began to really understand uh, what we've got to accomplish in Europe. Um, it became clear to me that uh, there was no way we could make our 30,000 look and feel like 300,000. Uh, unless I had the Army National Guard, the Air Guard, Army Reserve, as well as allies and others doing more. And that's really what I want to talk to you about this morning for just a few minutes. Give you an update on the current situation, uh, but also tell you what we're going to do about it. And like everybody in this room, you know, since I was a brand new cadet, or if you were a brand new private going through basic training, you're told, don't whine about it just figure out how to do the mission because you're never going to have enough resources. So, you know, we've tried to figure out how do we heal ourselves and do the mission that we've been given. So that's, that's what I want to show to you today. 
And then also, because uh, I love risk takers, we're going to take a little technology risk here. We've got three guardsmen out in Kosovo and in Bulgaria that we're going to try and connect in uh, for just a couple of minutes uh, so they can tell you uh, what they're doing. Now, I do want to introduce uh, Major General Ryan Gonzalez. Ryan, will you stand up? Ryan Gonzalez here in the very front row is the Commanding General of the 4th Infantry Division at Fort Carson, Colorado. I asked Ryan to come here because the Army has turned to the 4th Division to be the division aligned against Europe, along with 10th Special Forces Group. So Fort Carson is going to be focused on Europe. Uh, it'll take a little while to get the patch chart lined up, but I want to make sure everybody knew that uh, they saw Ryan here. And then my own National Guard team, uh, uh, Colonel Chuck Crosby and Lieutenant Colonel Matt Angelucci right here, uh, they are there in Wiesbaden with us. <laughs> Neither one of them is very good looking, so they gotta be good, so. <laughs> and then of course I wanna take any questions you might have. I'm, you're stuck with me all day long. Um, I'm anxious to hear old General Ham what he has to say later today. I think we're going to see um, several of the tags this afternoon, uh, but I am staying all day long. It was important enough to me to, to want to, to do this. So I love Admiral Stavridis, you know, former SACTIR. That was from him. This was after the uh, Secretary announced that we're going to put uh, European activity sets, equipment uh, in Europe. You know, the, the last tank left about two years ago, so did the last box of tank parts and the last HET. Uh, well, now it's coming back, so Army is putting an entire brigade combat team's worth of equipment on the ground in Europe. Most of it's there now, uh, but it's going to eventually be stationed out in EAS, European Activity Sets, in company and battalion size configurations in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. And I think something to consider is that maybe um, National Guard equipment goes in there as well. Uh, if you've got it, if you've got howitzers you want to put there. Tennessee's done a great job, by the way, putting leaving engineer equipment in Bulgaria, so I'll address that as we go along as well. But even Admiral Stavridis said, a great sailor, there's nothing like having troops on the ground being there. That's what we do. And whether that's 30,000 that lives there or it's rotational. And by the way, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Carter, said, um, I get it, Russia's number one uh, threat uh, to our nation but we're not going to add a single soldier. We can't. So you're going to have to do what they've done in CENTCOM for the last 14 years is make use of rotational forces. So I'm going to talk to you about how you can help us do that. Okay, first slide. So what is the problem? Um, I have to confess, even though I've served in Europe um, a few times, I did not realize or else I had forgotten that Kaliningrad is a piece of Russia and it's right there, that little wedge in between Lithuania and Poland. There's three brigades of uh, ground troops there. Uh, there's more air defense and uh, electronic warfare capability and long range missile capability there than you would find in any other European country. And that's just that one little piece there. And so what it does, as you can see from the rings, uh, it will deny access up into the Baltic Sea. And then you go down to Crimea with Russia's uh, invasion and illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, which you remember um, is still recognized as a part of the sovereign territory of Ukraine, uh, the capabilities that they've put there, plus the Black Sea Fleet, um, when they put an Iskander missile into Crimea, they can actually touch about 94% of the Black Sea. So the two main avenues or axes for coming in to reinforce our allies on the eastern flank of NATO uh, the Russians had the ability to deny that through uh, air defense, long-range missiles, and so on. So we're having to look for other places where we could do that if we had to. Obviously, Bremerhaven is important, but also seaports in Croatia and Slovenia at the north end of the Adriatic Sea, as well as other places in Western Europe. But you see that keeps moving it further and further west. So in order to give our political leaders the um, opportunity, some options, we've got to use speed. And my friend General Mick Nicholson, the commander of NATO's Land Command there, talks about speed matters. Now speed in terms of freedom of movement, speed in terms of being able to assemble capability so that we can deter Russian aggression versus having to counterattack and retake captured NATO countries' territory, such as in 
Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, obviously those three certainly see themselves as the most vulnerable. And the color there shows you in terms of how fast uh, they can get there. Now, I went to uh, Estonia a few months ago, and it was right after President Putin said, I can be in, uh, no, it was Lithuania, he said, I can be in Vilnius in four hours. And I got asked about that, and I said, well, I made it from Wiesbaden in three hours. So um, I, I told them uh, that we are there. We have American soldiers that are there. We have guardsmen that are rotating through there. We have Army reservists that are there. And we are committed to their defense. So that's what the assurance is all about. But you can understand why those nations that are that close feel that pressure. We did a uh, terrain overflight with Lithuania the other day, and General Leka, he's pointing out, he said, this is where they normally attack. I mean, this is not their first rodeo. They have, for centuries. And so they know all the traditional sites. And so we're working with them in a way that some of you uh, older soldiers would remember from the days of GDP where you had a battle book, you knew the route, you knew the name of the farmer, you knew the, the, um, where the, how far it was out to a high tension wire. That's what we're doing now in these Baltic countries. And we're doing it in Georgia also, helping them develop their op plans and uh, so they know that we will be there. We're putting ammunition up there. We've got training ammunition, obviously, but we're also going to put operational force protection ammunition in each of those countries as well so that if something happened while we have our soldiers there, which is 24-7 and almost all year long, you know, they've got the ability to defend themselves. Now, if you look at the little call-out box to the top right where it calls, talks about the Suwalki Gap, this is an area that's about 100 kilometers long from the corner of Kaliningrad to the corner of Belarus. Now, uh, this is not likely, but if you're trying to plan and envision a scenario and trying to explain why you need speed, um, a plausible scenario, and by the way, we've been surprised by every Russian snap exercise over the last year and a half, every single one. It's not because we're knuckleheads uh, or you know, we're not paying, trying to pay attention. The fact is we don't have capacity and capabilities that we used to have to monitor and watch what they're doing. You know, for correctly, for the last 14 years, you know, we've been building uh, Dari, Pashtu, and Arabic speakers. Uh, we've been focused on uh, SIGINT, chasing down the enemies of our country and killing lots of them. Uh, but we don't have the depth and the capabilities to watch the Russians the way that we used to. Russian speakers, Ukrainian speakers, and so on. And I know states out here have large populations of Russian and Ukrainian speakers and we are turning to the guard to ask for help. Because you can have satellites, but if you can't understand what's being said, the SIGINT really is not that helpful. It certainly won't be as responsive as it needs to be. And so that'll be, that's one of my asks, frankly, is help us with uh, Russian speakers and uh, Ukrainian speakers uh, from your states. But you can see a scenario where if they're able to do a snap exercise where 20, 30, 40,000 Russian troops show up um, in an exercise there in the corner of Belarus and the three brigades that they have, two army and one uh, naval infantry brigade in Kaliningrad and they decide to close the Suwaki Gap and then they deny access up into the Baltic Sea and then the Russians, of course, this is going to be an environment where all communications are, are shut down, massive part, uh, cyber effort. Um, and it won't be obvious. I mean, frankly, it'd be easy if it was T-72 tanks or T-80s lined up. That'd be easy. World's greatest Air Force would um, finish that for us in a short amount of time. But instead, it's going to be much more difficult. It's going to make it much more difficult for our political leadership to determine what's actually happening. And so that's the, the, the clocks. When does the clock start on decision making? So in that sort of scenario, the Russians or it could be making a terrible miscalculation that maybe Portugal, maybe Italy, that they won't agree that this is, or it'll take a long time before that they agree that this is an Article 5 situation where then NATO gets involved. And so do we, and of course the way the Russians talk about use of nuclear weapons, they've identified Romania, Denmark, and Sweden as nuclear targets. That's incredible. But they talk about it so much so you can start seeing a scenario then where snap exercise, close the Swalky Gap, isolate the three Baltic countries, and splash a nuke out in the Baltic Sea just to show that what they actually do have the capability. 
And then they say, you know, is the West really going to respond? The U.S. will respond, obviously. We've got American soldiers. Some of your soldiers are going to be inside those countries if and when that ever does happen. But in terms of our capability. So obviously we don't want it to ever get to that situation. And that's where speed comes in. Our ability to assemble, to demonstrate capability. And you know deterrence is all about having the capability and then demonstrating the ability to use it. That's where you come in. All right, next slide. So when I was a lieutenant uh, about 100 years ago, now there were 300,000 troops in Europe, mostly in West Germany. Uh, we had some in Italy, we had some in Turkey, of course. We had gigantic Air Force, a huge Navy. Uh, today, from an Army perspective, we had 30,000 regular Army soldiers that are stationed, uh, forward stationed in Europe, mostly in West Germany, uh, but also in Italy with the Airborne Brigade. We still have the same mission, though, assure our allies and to deter Russia from aggression. So my mission is to take our 30,000 and make it look and feel like 300,000. Now, the way we're going to do that is with these five pillars here, and, and if you will bear with me, I want to step through them. First pillar, obviously, empowering junior leaders. Now, it is not uncommon you go into a, uh, one of these countries in, East, in Eastern Europe in the Atlantic Resolve box, and the senior U.S. Army commander is a captain. And so the Prime Minister or the Minister of Defense knows the name of that captain by his first name. Or it may be uh, good old Craig Johnson from the Tennessee Army National Guard who was uh, overseeing uh, Resolute Castle, an engineering exercise where he had Alabama engineers in Romania and Tennessee engineers in Bulgaria and Craig Johnson moving back and forth. He's the senior American in those two countries. It, this is the norm. Our aviators, you know, with good old Fort Campbell, uh, I spent four tours there. You had two aviation brigades. The standard for safety for flying at Fort Campbell was up here, for maintenance was up here. We got the exact same standard and expectations for safety and maintenance in Europe, except our one little aviation brigade is split between Estonia and Bulgaria. And so very often you've got a lieutenant or a captain or a CW, uh, CW2 is the senior officer aviator do, making sure we're flying safe. And by the way, they're not flying from Montgomery County and uh, uh, Davidson County. I mean, they're going from Bulgaria to Alabama to Hungary to Poland. It was tough, but we have no choice. So empowering junior leaders uh, to do what we're having to do. Next pillar is National Guard and Army Reserve. Um, we have zero, zero bridges that can carry an M1A2 SEP tank. And some of you will remember, we used to have no bridges. You could go from France to England without ever getting wet. We have zero. Uh, we have no short-range air defense. Zero. No, it goes from Patriot to M4. Um, we have three uh, engineer battalions. One belongs to the 2nd Regiment, one belongs to the 173rd, and then we got the great 15th engineer battalion. That's it. Um, we have zero HIMARS, zero MLRS. Um, we have two towed artillery battalions, one each with a regiment and with the 173rd. And that's it. Uh, I, have a, I don't have enough Russian uh, or Ukrainian speakers to do what we need to do. Not just, not for SIGINT, but also for training the Ukrainians that we're training. I'm excited about the California Army National Guard is, going, is already in Ukraine helping, and they're going to take on more and more responsibility with this uh, joint multinational training group, Ukraine. You know, we're training MOI battalions right now. We just finished the second of the three Ministry of Interior battalions. Uh, we start training five Ukrainian army battalions in November. Uh, I can't sustain that. So uh, I need a National Guard solution. And we've got a great National Guard colonel from California who has Ukrainian experience that is going to become the commander of the Joint Multinational Training Group Ukraine um, for those five battalions. And most of his staff is going to be California Army National Guard. And it's going to be paratroopers from the 173rd. It's going to be uh, soldiers from 4th Division, 
it's going to be uh, Canadians and Lithuanians and probably two or three other countries that will be helping to do that. You're talking about strategic effect. That's what California is going to help us provide. But uh, there is plenty of work to be done. Now, you see that howitzer there. Uh, first time I pulled a lanyard in about 30 years, I was standing next to a PFC uh, from Michigan. Uh, I went out there. Going to, uh, normally don't let me touch sophisticated equipment. And this was one of the brand new howitzers. Uh, he said, sir, would you like to pull a lanyard? I said, well, well hell yeah, of course. And it's a mixed crew. You got Latvian and Michigan, Michiganders on the gun. And uh, he's instructed me, he said, you know, don't pull it with your arm. You got to hold it and then and turn your whole body. And he was exactly right. You know, it worked like a charm. And uh, they obviously were proud of that, what they were doing there. But also his confidence of uh, telling the CG, use your, you know, don't use your damn arm, sir. You know, you got to use your whole body. So, <laughs> of course, that guy was probably a bank president in his day job, too. So, uh, <laughs> he. He wasn't too impressed with the CG user. <laughs> um, looking at that uh, predator there, Texas uh, National Guard. Uh, normally, that thing would be employed watching Oklahoma University football practice. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's that's flying out of Latvia. And this was another thing. I'm I'm, I'm going to be candid with you um, uh, to see. Greg Vadness, I didn't, I didn't realize how much wasta that guy had. He's got Texas flying for him out of Latvia. Um, and, and then Greg leaves uh, the Texas tag in Latvia with a Lufthansa strike. I don't know how you pulled that off, man. But um, it's a great example of cooperation. You better believe that our brand new ambassador in Latvia, Ambassador Pettit, she's going on and on about, oh, man, we got these predators here and, and so on. And, you know, she didn't care. Well, it's, it, it, we got Texas Air National Guard predator, or we got U.S. Air Force predator. We got we got predator. That's the effect. And so you are helping us help our ambassadors uh, in ways that you know I would have never even uh, calculated before. Next slide. Now, um, I think. Uh, you know, I know Max is out there somewhere, uh, Tennessee, um, making the decision to leave its engineering equipment behind for next year's Resolute Castle. I can't thank you enough. I mean, not only is that a smart thing, because it's going to save us millions of dollars of shipping equipment back and forth, and I know things like engineer equipment are things that the governors are going to uh, be very picky about. You know, do they have enough of that sort of equipment there? But the fact that Tennessee is able to do it makes so much sense, and it also represents a commitment. Um, and then being able to see, uh, oh, uh, Lynn Gable was there with me in Romania at Chinku watching the Alabama Guardsmen. Uh, incredible work, made, having a huge impact on what we're trying to do using ERI money, European Reassurance Initiative money, and the ability of you guys to, to make that happen on pretty short notice, not in the normal cycle, was absolutely critical for us. But you can see there's other examples there. I have uh, um, offered to uh, General Cadaby um, the idea of, look, if you want to leave equipment over here, if it's Michigan howitzers, if it's uh, engineer equipment, if it's bridging, uh, if it's basic uh, armored vehicles, any equipment that you want, I think, whether it's a mate site at JMRC, by the way, and I love the, this, this idea of maybe a couple of uh, guard brigade rotations going through Hornfels for your CTC experience. It's about eight million um, times better in my view than NTC or JRTC because it's going to be multinational. You're going to be working with real allies where you'd have to fight. I think putting equipment there would be a great um, way to facilitate doing that. I know there's a tough decision every state will have to make. Um, I, the door, in, in fact, I wouldn't say you're pushing against an open door. There's no door on the hinge, and there's no caveat. How, whatever you want to do. Um, Ohio National Guard, uh, Debbie, I, I told you earlier, um, we had an air defense exercise that called Tobruk Legacy in the uh, Czech Republic. Um, four other nations brought their uh, uh, short-range air defense systems for shooting down UASs. Ohio National Guard brought Sentinel. We have no Sentinel either, by the way. So the Ohio National Guard, on three months' notice, that changed my thinking, my understanding of capability. When I talked to those uh, young men and women from Ohio, and I said, well, when did you guys find out you were coming here? And they said, three months ago. I, I did not know you could come that fast. So um, that was impressive.
So uh, I know you have a can't fail mission in the national capital region, and I wouldn't ask you to take any risk on that, obviously. Um, but if you've got Avengers, if you've got Sentinel that you want to put in Europe in one of our EAS locations, uh, we, we can do that. Uh, AMC is going to own the does own the European activity set mission that includes the maintenance, the security contract, all of that in each of these countries. Um, doesn't make any sense to have to set up a separate place for you unless it's for a mate site like in at JMRC and uh, Hohenfels. Um, but these other locations, why in the world would we not want to tuck it in that AMC uh, contracted uh, uh, maintenance facility that's going to be in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, and so on. So uh, answer is yes to anything that I control that we can do. Okay, there's another pillar. It's our allies. Um, that bridge you see right there in the middle is an incredible bridge. It's a German engineer battalion there at Minden. I watched them cross the Vesa River in 30 minutes, snapping together a bridge, and then we moved the tank company across it, and then we shot the uh, Patriot battery, had them roll across it. Uh, it's an incredible bridge, and it has one British engineer company is organic to this or attached to this uh, German engineer battalion. They have the same stuff. So you see Germans and British, you saw it in the video also. It's an incredible capability. So that's an example of where we're using other people's stuff to do what we have to do. Uh, next week, uh, on the 17th, 4th uh, Squadron of 2nd Cavalry Regiment um, is going to be moving all the way from uh, Vilsack, Rose Barracks, cross into, uh, through the Czech Republic, and go into Hungary, where they'll link up with a Hungarian Army Brigade. At the same time, an airborne company from the 173rd is landing on the far shore or far bank of the Danube River. The Hungarians are building a bridge over the Danube, and that striker regiment or squadron is going to cross uh, the Danube on a Hungarian bridge and then link up with another Hungarian unit on the other side and begin a five-week training exercise. And then they're going to pass back out through Romania, crossing the Danube River on a Romanian bridge. So this is now what we're doing as routine because we have to practice this interoperability. And you, a lot of you guys have done bridge, river crossings at nighttime. You know, there's signals where you marshal. There's a doctrine to it. Uh, you can't do that on a computer. You actually have to do it. You have to have drivers getting lost or falling asleep in the assembly area. You've got to have, you know, putting the bridges together in bad weather. Um, not that I have ever been lost at night in any set of circumstances, but I, <laughs> I, I have heard or that I may have fallen asleep in my vehicle that I was TCN. So um, that's, you got to practice that. And so uh, that's what we're working on. Helicopters, um, 12th Combat Aviation Brigade used to be the biggest aviation brigade in the Army. Uh, it now has uh, one attack battalion in it, uh, and that's up for review next year. So I'm looking for everything I can do to work with the, the Dutch and the British have Apaches. Uh, the Poles have incredible attack aviation. Um, looking, we put American soldiers on all sorts of other different aircraft. I suspect um, that some of you will have an interest um, or you see a training opportunity and a way to contribute with your aviation. And I'm not too fussed about what flavor, you know, what, where it is in terms of what level Apache you have or Black Hawk or whatever you have. Um, I mean, we don't have enough Chinooks to move one infantry brigade right now. So uh, I'm, we're open for business. Okay. Next slide. Uh, the Regionally Aligned Force, um, this is, you know, uh, the Army's answer to how do you deliver land capability to the combatant commanders. And we are very lucky to have the 4th Infantry Division designated as the division headquarters that's uh, allocated against uh, Europe. And um, the, uh, it'll take about another year, year and a half for the patch chart to sort itself out. But eventually, the Aviation Brigade, the Striker Brigade, the Light Brigade, the Heavy Brigade, the Sustainment Brigade, you know, now that I'm old, I care a lot more about logistics than when I was young. That shit used to just show up. Um, now it's like, um, uh, actually, uh, I have to be involved in it. Um, so, <laughs> um, but getting all them lined up behind our European challenge um, is, is brilliant because now Fort Carson is going to be think, waking up every morning thinking about you know Russia, thinking about Europe, thinking about our allies uh, in a way. And so I hope that each of you that are state partner or maybe you've got a um, uh, you see opportunity for training and contributing, track down Ryan Gonzalez also and uh, 
tell him, you know, he could, because that's who I depend on to run all the Atlantic Resolve exercises. Fourth Division Mission Command Element, 90 people. They reach back. You know, this is not the old days where you had to get a, a division headquarters, you had to have 100 generators and acres of tents. It's 90 people would reach back into Fort Carson for analytical planning and, and so on. And then Ryan has done a fantastic job of rotating his officers and NCOs through there to give us that capability. He is the one who has provided mission command for everything that's happening from Estonia to Bulgaria, that division headquarters there. Um, he needs some skills also. So if you're looking for people to get division level command and control experience working in a division headquarters, there's opportunity there. And then of course, I mentioned aviation. Right now we've got an aviation battalion uh, from uh, Fort Stewart um, that we depend on, and there's another one coming in after that, and eventually it'll, they'll all be Iron Horse um, Aviation, I believe, although aviation is stretched to the max. Um, special Forces 10th Group is lined up, and if, if you've got Special Forces that are looking for opportunities to train in Europe, 10th Group is a way to come into it uh, as well. Okay, and then the last pillar of how do you make 30,000 look and feel like 300,000 uh, I want the Russians over there going, God almighty, how many, how many people do they have? They must have 300,000 people because they see so many different patches showing up all the time. So we do uh, engagements all over the place. Uh, we look, we uh, welcome when a congressional delegation comes over. Uh, we look for every opportunity to support DV days, um, uh, exercises, and it's all about showing that American flag and different uh, U.S. patches all over the place. So even though there might only be a company that partici participates in an exercise, um, you get the picture here of creating strategic effect to usher our allies and to deter Russia. So each of those markers there represents a battalion level exercise or larger. Every one of them was multinational. Every one of them had US uh, forces in it. Now it may have been, uh, in fact, I would say probably half of those the U.S. participant was a guard unit. You know, they're not asking, well, they actually are asking for a division in every country, but if, if you have a company or uh, uh, an aviation element or some capability that's in each of those countries, that gives them the assurance that you, we are committed. When you put an American soldier inside a country that's uh, just a few kilometers from the Russian border, that's assurance. That's assurance. So you see there, that's what we've, we have done and are doing this year. Next year's gonna be even bigger. Uh, exercise Anaconda um, is something that I'd like for all to be marked on your calendar. Um, it's Poland's national exercise. It normally happens in September every other year. Uh, the Poles shifted it to June this year, uh, the month before the Warsaw Summit, which they're hosting. And uh, we're gonna have 12 to 15,000 American soldiers, both forward station, rotational, and the GRF from the 82nd is gonna come over and uh, join an equal number of poles in this exercise. It will be all over the country, and uh, it's gonna have the joint live fire uh, aspect to it, maneuver, big time logistics. We're gonna converge into Poland from the places we're deployed uh, in order to practice that speed I talked about so that our political leadership sees that they have capabilities that give, give them some options and so that the Russians see that, yes, we can that we could do that too. Okay, I think that was my last slide. Now I'm gonna go out on a limb here and the, we've got three short v, um, VTC links. Uh, the first one is the Lieutenant Colonel John Kennedy from North Carolina. He's in uh, K4. All right, John, let's see if this works. See how good your cigar is. Very good, all right, man, it works.
infrastructure and economy, extremist influence, organized crime, and the refugee crisis. The Army National Guard is the ideal sourcing component for the K-4 mission because we know defense support to civil authorities. K-4 is very similar to a DISC mission conducted overseas rather than in our home states. As third responders behind law enforcement agencies from Kosovo and the European Union, we must always be prepared to act in case Kosovo's institutions become overwhelmed by civil unrest. We will bring many new skills and ideas back home with us. For example, our company level units are receiving some of the best crowd riot control training from some of NATO's most experienced soldiers. For the Army and for USERA, this is an economy of force operation in a budget constrained environment. K-4 is a model for the, how the Army and USERA can take advantage of the Army National Guard's strengths. This mission supports the sustainable readiness model for Army National Guard units in their available cycle. Here we are forging seamless partnerships on behalf of U.S. Army Europe, and we have two battalion-level command posts, one from Connecticut and the other from North Carolina. And in their formations, they include soldiers from Armenia, Austria, Germany, Hungary, Poland, Slovenia, and Turkey. For us, there is no point in labeling something a multinational operation because everything we do in Kosovo is inherently multinational. This deployment is also an opportunity to nurture state partnerships across Europe. For example, we were able to train during an exercise in Germany alongside Moldova, one of North Carolina's state partners. We are also supporting Iowa's state partnership with Kosovo and Ohio's with Serbia during our time here. Altogether, in the past three months, our soldiers have had the opportunity to train alongside and get to know soldiers from at least 16 partnership uh, partner nations. Uh, at this time, allow me to have Captain Elliott tell you a little bit about what he is doing here in Kosovo. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Captain Elliott from the 1st of the 150th Cavalry Regiment of the West Virginia National Guard, and I currently serve as the Executive Officer for the United States Liaison Monitoring Team here in Kosovo. As LMT, we operate under Joint Regional Detachment South, a Turkish command, with the commission of feeling the pulse of our locally assigned communities. This mission is tailored suited to a National Guard unit because we function as a front line for building and maintaining relationships between local civil authorities and the Kosovo forces. Every town within Kosovo is assigned an LMT, and through our close relationships with these leaders, we are the first to identify and report changes in the local atmospherics. On a regular day, our soldiers will conduct key leader engagements with Kosovars, who range from the mayor's office on down to the local coffee shop owner and even rambunctious school children. As a junior leader, this opportunity has enabled me to learn how to successfully operate alongside our multinational partners here in K-4. The U.S. is only one of several countries who are tasked with this mission. At JRD South, we are fortunate to operate alongside Polish, Turkish, Austrian, and Swiss soldiers alike. Our relationships with our partner nations has personally developed my relational and communication skills as we continue to ensure Kosovo remains a safe and secure environment with freedom of movement for its people. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. This concludes our brief. I'll be followed by our next briefer. He looks like he's 14 Good morning, years sir. old. Man. In August. Hey, is that uh, Todd Lawrence from Tennessee? Yes, sir. All right, Todd. Todd's uh, area in Sofia, Bulgaria. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Major Todd Lorenz, Tennessee Army National Guard soldier, leveraged through the Tennessee State Partnership Program to U.S. Army Europe as, as a G3 operations liaison officer supporting Atlantic Resolve South. I'm calling from the Office of Defense Cooperation at the U.S. Embassy in Sofia, Bulgaria, where I'm on mission to assist the Bulgarian country team, host nation military, on on U.S. Army combined training exercises with Bulgarians and various other NATO allies. Key tasks include in coordinating and assisting U.S. Army combined training exercises at Novosela Training Area, Bulgaria, Synchroniz synchronization and reporting through 4th ID mission command element, and various high visibility strategic level training exercises I've had the opportunity to work on include steadfast LEV, swift response, NATO certification exercises, Kabila 15 to include Freedom Shoot, the first U.S. tanks to fire in Bulgaria, and Essen, a forthcoming NATO certification exercise beginning in October. Efforts concentrated to replicate or enable 30,000 soldiers to look and feel like 300,000 soldiers. 
Additionally, Resolute Castle 15, a Tennessee Army National Guard engineer range construction mission, is essential to enveloping quality operational training environment for U.S. Army, Bulgarian Air and Land Forces, participating allies, and state-to-state -state partner training visitors to combine training exercises in Bulgaria. Sir, the road ahead involves essential coordination and communication to support the arrival of regionally aligned forces and European activity set beginning this fall and continuing into 2016. Finally, sir, in Atlantic Resolve South, we as the U.S. Army are recognizing increasing opportunities to enhance the Bulgarian military's interoperability, adaptability, endurance, and overall depth as achievable goals through the Developing Countries Combined Exercise Program Initiative. Sir, this concludes our briefings. At this time, we're standing by for your questions. Excellent. How about it? All three of those guys. So um, what you see there is you've got very young people uh, with gigantic responsibilities, uh, and they are each contributing in places that have strategic impact for the United States. Uh, reliance on liaison officers or executive officers, uh, multinational formations, um, and they didn't come in a box like that. I mean, this is years of building experience, uh, of getting opportunities, and uh, you know, when I walk into each of, uh, to visit the Army Chiefs of our allies, usually the first thing I see when I walk in the office is a plaque from their state partner state. When I walk into Al Lake's office, first thing I see is a great big Pennsylvania Army National Guard right in my face there. So uh, I am a slow learner, but I picked up pretty quick that um, those Army Chiefs, and when uh, Nick Chuka from Romania talks about spending Thanksgiving on the lake with uh, Perry Smith, you know, I bro I've broken the code. Um, you know, instead of fighting that, say, Perry, what else can you do? Like, invite me to go fishing with you. Um, <laughs> so, um, I guess really what I'm saying is that um, I need you. The Army needs you. Uh, and no caveats. Uh, obviously, figuring out how do, you, how do you pay for everything, whether it's Active Guard or Reserve, figuring out how to do that. Um, but I am... Uh, Everywhere we can use ERI money, we're doing that. Um, with that. By the way, without ERI money, and I see Mr. Mr. Womack sitting there, I'm, sir, I'm sorry I didn't see it when I first walked up here, the great congressman uh, and guardsman himself from Arkansas. Um, you know, without ERI, <laughs> it was your dark brown hair that gave you away there. Sorry, I was probably didn't. Um, without ERI, there's none of this is happening. I mean, there's no rotational force. There's no equipment forward. There's nothing. There'll be 30,000 American soldiers uh, guarding their concern and uh, visiting Hohenfels, you know, once a year. With no ERI, there's none of that. No, no deterrence, no assurance. So let me uh, conclude with a couple of thoughts. I, I think this afternoon we have an opportunity uh, with several of the, any of the tags, frankly, that, that are interested in specific requirements or opportunities or requests or anything, suggestions you have for how we can make it easier uh, for you to uh, come uh, be part of Strong Europe. I am, uh, want to figure out how to do that, and I think y'all know how to help me do it. Um, I would ask, I, I, I would love for you to come through Wiesbaden whenever you do um, go to visit your troops or, or work with your allies, your partners uh, on the way in or on the way out because you will know things that I won't know in 100 years about what the requirements are inside that state. So I would welcome that. You, you would be very welcome at Wiesbaden. Stay there at Old Clark House. My residence there is named after General Bruce Clark, hero of uh, Battle of St. Vith in 1944, and then he was the use of your commanding general in 1960 to 62 during the Berlin crisis. I um, want you to stay there, see what we're doing, and, and then you think about ways that you have um, that can help us be smarter about what we're doing. So uh, that's a sincere invitation. Um, I think the, you know, four Texas National Guardsmen were wounded uh, in the MFO mission. You know, I was a cadet when that mission started. And probably just two or three years ago, most of us were thinking, you know, why are we still, why are we still there? You know, but National Guard kept, stayed there. 
uh, the Army depended on you to do that. Now you have four soldiers uh, wounded, um, and the fact that General Milley, our chief, went straight to go find them, to, to check on them, to, to put a purple heart on all four of those soldiers. Uh, you know, he didn't say, hey, Tim Cadaby, do you want to come over and put a purple heart on these four guardsmen? It was General Milley, Chief Staff of the Army, going straight to four soldiers to put a purple heart on those four soldiers. <laughs> so uh, I think I've used up most of the oxygen in the room. Um, I am, I'll stick around here during the break, uh, and I am here all day. Um, if I can take questions now, Deb, or we can, or we can leave. I'll do however you want to want to do this. General Hodges, good morning. Perry Smith from Alabama. <laughs> is this my invitation? I hope, man. So, sir, you know the invitation is always open. Anytime you, anytime you need, I'll call in sick and we'll go fishing. <laughs> sir, thank you for being here. I know your schedule is jam-packed, and we really appreciate you being here. And thank you for your support of the the National Guard. You know, you hit so many good things today. We need you and you need us. And the training that we get, the 21 states and the 22 countries over there, we, we get it. Uh, we're doing a heck of a job. It represents a hell of an opportunity for us to do realistic, good, professional training with, with these uh, other countries, and it's, it's just a great deal. You know, probably not many people in this room remember the, uh, the old Western TV program, Paladin. There's this hired gun, that, uh, and he had this card that he gave out. He was a professional uh, hired gun. And <laughs> his motto was, have gun, will travel. Right. And that's basically what the, National Guard represents. We don't have any money. And my question to you is, can you think of anything we can do to help you acquire the money that you need to get us over there more often? Because we're looking for additional opportunities, but our limitation is the money. Can you think of anything we can do to help you raise the skids to, to get us some more money to make these great opportunities come to life? Great. Uh, Perry, thanks for that. Uh, there's three or four things. One, obviously, continuing to push uh, for ERI, and I, I think that's uh, a way that we're going to be able to do that in the near term. Um, I saw a slide uh, the other day that indicated that uh, state partnership program funding might be starting to dip. I, obviously, I'm a billion percent opposed to that. Um, so continuing to uh, uh, help educate uh, decision makers on the, the value of the state partnership program. Now, I will tell you this, uh, in speaking in all candor, uh, not everybody on the Hill I, believes in the strategic effect of the state partnership program. I think there's very few of them left, but I, I talked to a SASC staffer uh, the other day, and he was remembering back maybe how it was 12, 13, 14 years ago where um, it didn't have quite the operational effect that it does now. So I think um, all of us still have some uh, education work to do on the Hill uh, with staffers to make sure that they understand, you know, that this is not a European tour opportunity or that it's uh, um, something uh, beyond or where money, tax money is being diverted for things that are not uh, necessarily related to achieving that defense effect. Now, I personally believe it, it is okay, in fact, I would encourage that, that if uh, Texas and Nebraska with Czech or Illinois with Poland, if, if that grew into university connections and stuff like that, but I think that there's, we got a little work to do to make sure that we can protect the uh, state partnership program. Um, and then uh, the, the third thing I think that will help us significantly is getting Atlantic Resolve designated as a named operation, OAR. 
uh, I think if you have it, uh, Operation Atlantic Resolve, it moves up in uh, how the uh, Joint Staff and OSD uh, fund uh, things. Uh, and then I think that also would release some uh, capabilities for us to be able to turn to uh, the Guard for those capabilities like bridging, like aviation, like air defense uh, that is a little bit more difficult to get. And frankly, right now, um, I think my mind's wire obstacle to getting uh, the named operation is somewhere in the Joint Staff. So uh, I am hoping that we can get some help um, to pressure on, on the Joint Staff. Now, obviously, they're, they're not bad guys or dumb guys. I mean, they're looking, they've got X amount of dollars too, and there's other requirements out there. Um, but if the chairman, the vice chairman, and the army chief all say it's the number one threat, the secretary of defense says Russia's number one threat, but we got 2% of the budget in Europe and only 5% of the army structure, that's a disconnect. So um, getting it named as a, getting OAR as a no kidding formally named operation would help. Finally, for your own planning, uh, we do something called the CTC, the Combined Training Conference. We do it twice a year at Ober Emmergau. And um, the next one is, I think, 16 to 20 November. Uh, we push the planning horizon out three years for exercises. So uh, we had 37 different countries show up thing. This is what the U.S. Army does. You know, we provide a gravitational pull on everybody else. The Army, we don't have to do it all, but if we do it, other people will come join and be a part of it. So this has turned into a great place to find exercises where you can match your requirements and opportunities against uh, what's out there uh, all over Europe. So I would encourage you to make sure that you send somebody from the state. Um, this is not limited to state partners or anybody else. Send somebody to that CTC at Ober Emmergau and, uh, and look, find the training opportunities for different capabilities um, that you might have. Okay. Hey, sir. Corey Carr, Indiana. All right, one more, Corey. You're, take, you're taking a break time, so. All right, hurry. Hey, sir, uh, our state partner activities, uh, we want to focus those on your theater security cooperation objective, but there's a perception in the Pentagon that Army commands don't know what state partners are doing. What can we do to make sure that we're synchronized well uh, with your team uh, to achieve those objectives. Thanks, Corey. Um, well, first of all, uh, I want to make sure that your states know what you're doing. So um, after the uh, Alabama Guardsmen left, um, I, I called the uh, Montgomery uh, newspaper uh, and did a telephone interview with them to brag on what these Guardsmen had been doing there. And I'm trying to do that in each state, actually, to reach back. Because I know, I learned this from watching Secretary Guerin when he was Secretary of the Army. You know, he was a former congressman from Fort Worth, Texas. And the first thing he did in the morning was not read the Washington Post, he read the Dallas-Fort Worth newspaper. So um, I'm thinking in, you know, indirectly to wait, make sure that the Congress is aware of what's going on is by reaching out to your, and I hope you don't mind I do that, but reach back to the media that supports your communities to make sure that they know that how much I appreciate and how much I value what's being done. Uh, we are also working hard uh, inside U.S. Army Europe to get um, a little bit quicker on advertising what's going on. If you check the U U.S. Army Europe, uh, the Strong Europe webpage, um, almost every single day, one of the six articles that moves through there, when, and I'm on them all the time, uh, to keep it fresh, there is a guard unit that's a part of it. Now, that doesn't reach every corner of America, uh, and uh, so I'm looking for every opportunity as well in the Joint Staff, in OSD, to talk about how much I depend on what you bring to it. So. You've got an advocate in me, um, but I think uh, looking for opportunities to uh, highlight that on the Hill uh, will be uh, critical as well. Thanks very much, guys.